Chapter 44 A beaming face beamed out across the world. This is the London Olympics. In the stadium, flags flew, athletes marched, and the cheering of a million voices roars towards the summer sky like a prayer of thanks. In the professor's study, Jim popped the cork from a bottle of champagne. Easy does it, Jim, said the old man. That's a hundred-year-old vintage. Put it on the slate, the lad replied, distributing large libations. In five minutes, the games begin. In six, John and I take a stroll down to Bubs, in the company of the local constabulary. In an hour, we shall be gloriously drunk. I'll change to that, said O'Malley. A toast to the Brentford Olympics. To the games, said Jim, although not to their founder. Hmm... John sipped champagne. That blackguard. What was he, Professor? Was he a man or a devil or what? I'm not certain even Caliton knew that. He loathed mankind because he was not of man. Thus he had to prove he was greater than man. His character, if indeed he possessed one in the true sense of the word, was one of constant turmoil, a torment of raw conflicts. He was ego, power, Good and evil by degree. He denied all human emotion, but he was subject to it nevertheless. Egoism, pride, monomania. He craved recognition for his own mad genius. The stadium, said John. Indeed, yes. The stadium was to be his apotheosis. I believe that had the stadium taken life, it would have literally been unstoppable. Then why didn't he set the thing off last night? His super-ego would not allow it. He wanted the whole world watching when he demonstrated his power. I had to count on his human weakness. It was all I had. You took a bit of a chance then, said O'Malley. I took many chances. That Norman's car would work. That you would be in the right place at the right time with your suitcase. Pooley looked long and hard at the old man. There has been something of a run on happy coincidence lately, he observed. Professor Slocum winked. I don't happen to believe in it myself. Drink up, Jim. I'll open another bottle. Pooley peered into his glass. So, Colleton was not the soul of the world then. He asked in a tone which almost amounted to disappointment. O'Malley gazed at him strangely. No, Jim said the professor, dusting off another antique bottle. I refuse to believe that. Keleton was composed of a chaos of organisms. You saw that for yourself. For him to maintain human form, or any other form for that matter, became more and more difficult for him. He knew his time was running out. I believe that Keleton was somehow a product of the very pollution and decay he loathed so much. The product of many centuries festering evil made flesh. I hate to say anything in his favour, Pooley replied, but there was a lot of truth in what he said. Great wrong has been done to the planet. Entropy is the order of the day. We've all been part of it, but we've never paid attention. Now no one will know what he said, nor, I suspect, do anything about it if they did. Good riddance to him, said O'Malley. Pooley shook his head. But someone should do something, John. The world is going down the plug hole. I realise that now. My eyes have been well and truly opened. What if Caliton was the first of a coming race? He's been a warning. Men must change their ways or pay a high price. Professor Slocum nodded. A man of independent means might dedicate himself to such a cause, he suggested. What do you say, Jim? Pooley smiled patted his million-pound pocket and raised his glass for a refill. I say yes, Professor. I have much to be thankful for. I say yes. You are a good man, Jim. Perhaps the future will find you to be a great one, although... Although what, Professor? Well, said the old man thoughtfully, I feel that somewhere there is a loose end, that somehow I've missed something obvious. There are still a lot of unanswered questions. Tempera parte to call to veritas, said John. Ay, said Jim. In time the hidden truth will hide, said Professor Slocum. 
Park up, said O'Malley, sticking his head out through the French windows. Sounds like they're on the starting blocks. High above Brentford, the stadium was hushed. Upon the rostrum, the master of ceremonies raised his starting pistol to begin the first race. All over the world, men drew closer to their television sets and held their breath. They're under start as otis, cried Jim. I am rich. <laughs>